Well, we're going to continue our coverage of the mass shooting uh, in Maine. We just heard a press conference, and you heard from Vlad a lot of the details that were revealed in that press conference. Robert Card, a 40-year-old man, has gone from a person of interest to a suspect facing murder charges. We know that there were two locations um, that the shootings occurred at, and we got a little more detail about um, when the shootings happened. The initial 911 calls came in at just 6.56 uh, last night at the just-in-time Recreational Center in Lewiston. There, um, seven people were killed, uh, six men and one woman. And then just 7.08, really not long after the first series of 911 calls, another location, a Smenji's, which is, a, uh, they call it a Smenji's Billiards. It's sort of like a restaurant as well. Um, eight men killed, one inside, and the rest of them um, one outside, rather, and the rest of them inside the facility. Three other people, well, several people were transported to hospital, but three people died um, at the hospital, bringing the total number of dead to 18, 13 injured. Uh, the police would not talk about the ages. Uh, they weren't prepared to give out that information, um, but they were, but they have released information about Robert Card earlier today. A little bit of misinformation about his level of training in terms of firearms. He is not a firearms instructor, but he was, he is uh, part of the uh, Army Reserve, and he's described as a petroleum expert. Um, so, our Elaine Keanu has been uh, covering this story on the ground for us, and we, we want to take you there. We also have um, Charles Marino standing by. He's a former Homeland Security Department advisor and agent. But I'm going to start with you, um, Elaine. Uh, this is, you know, this is something that can rock any community, but particularly in Maine, where they don't have a lot of homicides. That's exactly right. And I spoke with one resident this morning who basically, when I asked him, have you ever had anything comparable like this happen here? He said, absolutely not. This is just a quiet, peaceful, rural community. Um, he kind of described it as a big, small town. Folks kind of know each other here, um, or they know of each other. And so uh, you can only imagine just how quickly um, the news of this has spread and the devastation for the families of the victims. Uh, so much pain, and yet the search is ongoing. So even as this community begins to deal uh, with coming to terms with what happened, there is an active search underway. And we heard in that news conference just a short time ago that this individual, now a suspect, uh, as you said, Robert Card, is considered armed and dangerous, not to be approached uh, obviously at all and so that as you can only imagine is only adding to the absolute level of fear and anxiety uh, as this manhunt continues and so are people still being instructed to shelter in place what are what are they hearing from uh, police there so they are um, but you'll see that every so often there are cars that are uh, going by behind me here. That's because this is sort of a main artery, a lot of truck traffic. Um, a lot of vehicles have been going back and forth. However, if you kind of go uh, just beyond this main road, you can see that there really isn't anything open. Um, empty parking lots of businesses, empty parking lots of restaurants. Um, it is the middle of the day, a time when you might expect to see businesses with their doors open, welcoming customers. That is not the case here in Lewiston right now. So there is a very palpable sense of fear and anxiety. As I said, um, some folks here uh, saying, you know, they are still really, frankly, in disbelief that something like this could happen here. Um, and I'm just sort of looking quickly, um, Elaine, at uh, the president's statement. And of course, the president mm -hmm. says once again, our nation is mourning after yet another senseless and tragic mass shooting. Today, Jill and I are praying for the Americans who have lost their lives for those still in critical care and for their families, survivors, and community members enduring shock and grief. He goes on further down in the statement to say, while we had made progress on gun safety through the Bipartisan Safe, Safer Communities Act, the two dozen executive actions I've taken and the establishment of the first ever White House Office of Gun Violence uh, Prevention, it is simply not enough. And Elaine, it sort of brings me to the gun laws in Maine. And um, during the press briefing, 
a couple of reporters asked, how does somebody uh, dealing with mental health issues get their hands on a gun? But the truth of the matter is, in Maine, um, in terms of, there's not a lot restricting you from, from, from getting your hands on a gun. Yeah, that's right. And so you heard the officials say there, basically, they're looking at all those questions. Um, and this is an issue that we should note is not unique to this community, right? Mm -hmm. How many times have we talked about these kinds of issues in other incidents? So it is certainly not something uh, that is unique. Um, something that, though, is always scrutinized in these kinds of situations. What are those laws surrounding firearms? What laws um, could have prevented this? Mm -hmm. um, it is certainly something that we always hear debated uh, in, unfortunately, what has become an all too common event in this country. Definitely. Um, so, listen, Charles, let me pivot over to you because you know uh, what police are going through right now. Um, mm -hmm. They are looking for this man, Robert Card. Initially, they had released information about him being a firearms instructor. It turns out that's not the case, uh, but he is uh, in the reserves. He's got an active military ID. And from the way he looks like he's holding the gun, it, it looks like he knows what he's doing. Yeah, there's an obvious familiarity and, and comfort with weapon handling. You can tell that by the photo <clears throat> that's been released. What, what I can tell you is I, I expected to hear what we heard in the press conference. Mm. Uh, the, the state police are now very clearly identified as the lead agency working with the Lewiston police and being augmented by federal agencies and other local police in the area. Um, updates on victims, uh, unfortunately, those that have been injured, uh, some uh, may continue to pass, so we'll expect uh, continuous updates on that. And the fact that uh, Mr. Card is now a, a identified suspect mm -hmm. going from a person of interest now that the arrest warrants been issued. What I can tell you, though, based on the fact that this is a, a rapid and ongoing investigation, there is information about the individual that they're just not going to want to release mm. or that they don't know. And, and I think you heard that transparently during the press conference, that this is so rapidly evolving that they are conducting in the investigation, not just in Maine, but across other states, uh, to get as much information on the background of this individual as possible. And finally, they will issue a BOLO, a be on the lookout for any type of vehicle mode of transport associated and available to this suspect, mm -hmm. right? They're going to cast as wide a net as they can uh, and, and make sure that local authorities have that information. Technology is put in place like license plate readers to capture that in the event that he's on the run uh, in a vehicle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, well, we point out that we had gotten some information yesterday. They had to issue a correction. So I'm sure moving forward, they want to be really yeah. careful about what they say um, about this investigation. But some of the details that they gave us yesterday that they s sort of didn't want to really dive too much into during the press briefing was about his mental health uh, status. That, according to police, um, there had been uh, mental health issues, including hearing voices, and had possibly threatened to shoot up a military installation in southern Maine. What are some of the factors that influence the way this search will unfold? Uh, or I guess I, the question that I am asking is, when you have somebody who knows his way about a gun and maybe in the middle of a mental health crisis, does that have an impact on the way the investigation or the search for him unfolds? Well, I think right now the priority is to locate him. And I think there's no doubt, Amory, that authorities will go back and dissect what took place previously with respect to his mental health mm -hmm. and, and any engagement with law enforcement. These are the common two areas where unfortunately in these types of situations, we see a gap in information sharing. Now, you brought up local laws. They do play a role. Maine does not have a red flag law mm. that allows mental health officials to take action. They have what's called a yellow flag law which means law enforcement are the only people that can take action regarding the removal of weapons from somebody suffering a mental health crisis. So the big question and the obvious question is, 
did mental health officials share information with law enforcement? Mm. Did law enforcement know what was going on with this individual uh, regarding his weapons and how many weapons he had registered to himself? Right. All really good questions. I was also, you know, struck by the locations for these two mass shootings. Just in time recreation center, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Schmegley's billiards hall. I mean, no, it's in the middle of the week, but these are sort of family friendly places. Well, I can tell you they're soft targets, mm. right? They're not going to have much. They're not going to have much in the way of security. The suspect likely knew that, pre-planned this attack. And look, it's a small town, and these were likely two popular places. So they became, based on the number of people that gather at these spots, high-value targets for this suspect. And so he knows the area. He knew where to go to carry out this attack. He knew that there would be little resistance in the way of security, and he had an escape plan. He knew exactly mm -hmm. what he was going to do after he, he carried out the attack, uh, and now he's on the run. So just because somebody is suffering from a mental health crisis, and I've got a lot of experience in dealing with people, unfortunately, that suffer from this, but they're still able to formulate a plan of attack. Mm -hmm. So you have to look, do they, do they maintain the competency to formulate a plan and carry that out with the mental health crisis in the background, driving them to make very, very poor decisions, but take to take violent actions. But the fact that they can formulate the plan, the fact that they may have resources available to them, all of this goes towards the actual threat level that they present, not only during the attack, but after the attack. Mm -hmm. Charles makes a whole lot of sense when you talk about having a plan. He moved really quickly between those two locations. Um, Elaine, quickly, you know, during the press conference, we saw a lot of people standing up there. Which agencies are involved in this investigation? Yeah, so we know among them, right, a number of federal agencies, including the U.S. Marshals, uh, ATF, alcohol, tobacco and firearms agents, uh, the FBI. And then it's interesting, Henry, as we were standing here just a moment ago, we saw with its lights on uh, going down the road here very quickly, a Department of Homeland Security vehicle, a marked vehicle followed by an unmarked uh, vehicle. They were speeding along in this direction behind me here, unclear what that was about. Um, but it just goes to the enormous amount of resources being poured into this search right now. Charles Marino and Elaine Cano, thank you so much. Well, the new Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, spoke to reporters about the shooting in Maine earlier this morning. Let's take a listen. We are receiving information about this horrific tragedy. Uh, it has moved everyone in the Congress, as you might imagine. Our hearts go out to all those involved, the families, of course, of the victims. And we're so grateful for law enforcement. We trust and hope and pray that they're able to apprehend this individual as quickly as possible. There's no more injury or loss of life. This is a, this is a dark time in America. We have a, a, a lot of problems, and we're really, really hopeful and prayerful. Prayer is appropriate in a time like this, that the evil can end and this senseless violence can stop. And so that's, that's the statement this morning for the, on behalf of the entire House of Representatives. Everyone wants this to end, and I'll leave it there.